The Web 3.0 space holds limitless possibilities to revolutionize every single aspect of our online lives. From finance to social media, there are many different industries that are primed for disruption. That being said, blockchain technology has its own set of problems that have to be solved, and there are a number of hurdles that must be overcome in order for this to reach mass adoption. And in this video, I want to talk about one of the biggest problems that it faces, and one solution in particular that can be a game changer for this. This is really critical that you understand this, that you understand where the space is headed. And I'm going to talk about all this in this video today as a blockchain developer who works with this technology on a daily basis. So if you're new around here, Hey, I'm Gregory, and on this channel, I turn you into a blockchain master. So if that's something that you're interested in, then smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. That really helps these videos out so the more people learn about blockchain. And make sure you subscribe to this channel. And if you want to know how to become a blockchain master step-by-step -step start to finish, land your first blockchain developer job, then head on over to dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp to get started today. All right, so let's get into this. Let's talk about one of the biggest problems that the entire crypto space faces and a solution to this problem that's gaining a lot of steam and holds a lot of potential to be a real game changer for this. So let's define the problem first. This is what's called minor extractable value, or also called maximal extractable value, depending on who you ask. And the acronym for this is MEV. Okay, so you might have seen this floating around online, and you might have encountered minor extractable value yourself. But let me, you know, give you a quick recap so that you can understand the nature of the problems so that you can see the solution. So basically, you know, whenever you're using blockchains, um, it, typically speaking, it looks like this. You know, a user is trying to make a transaction to the chain, right? They submit their transaction. And when they do that, they give it to the blockchain. The blockchain has all these different nodes, which are just computers that make up the network. And depending on which blockchain you use, it might have miners, it might have validators. These are the people that run the blockchain that are responsible for processing that transaction and including it into the chain. So let's say that you were going to go trade a token like on Uniswap, for example. You know, whenever you do this, you connect with your wallet and you tell which tokens you have, and which tokens you want to receive. You click swap and that actually submits that transaction to the blockchain and the automated market maker on the back end powered by smart contracts actually facilitates that transfer because it's a decentralized exchange or a DEX. OK, and so whenever you do this, your transaction doesn't instantly go into the blockchain. OK, so. You know, anytime you create a transaction, it's going to get included into a block, which are really just bundles of records that are chained together to make up the blockchain. And before it gets included into a block, it goes into a place called the mempool. OK, and inside the mempool are all the other transactions that are waiting to be processed. It's like a queue, a pending state uh, before they get processed and included into the blockchain, whether they're mined or validated, depending on which blockchain that you're using. And so right here, when there's transactions in the mempool, you have a bunch of other people's transactions that are inside of there and the miners or the validators who are running the blockchain can see all this stuff, okay? And they can also submit transactions directly to the mempool whenever they see this. And so can any other user that has mempool access. And if they can see how your transaction is going to affect the state of the blockchain, they can submit their own transactions ahead of yours or even directly after to try to take advantage of that and manipulate the outcome. And sometimes it actually results in a different outcome than the one that you expected, often to your detriment. So let me explain how that works. So let's go back to our example of trading a token on Uniswap. Let's say you bought some uh, small cap cryptocurrency and, you know, your price was you're going to get 50 tokens if you gave it, you know, uh, $50. So it's pegged to the dollar at that point. OK, so whenever you do that, uh, anytime you buy on Uniswap, you're essentially affecting the price. Uh, if you're buying tokens, you're going to make the price of that token go up for selling it. You're going to make it go down. So let's say that you wanted to buy some. OK, well, whenever you do that, your transactions go to the mempool and somebody can actually submit transactions right before you buy and then also right after you buy. Uh, depending on the amount of gas that you're willing to pay, and they can actually profit from your transaction while you're, you know, losing money. So let's say that you were going to buy cryptocurrency for a certain amount. Well, if they see that in the mempool, they can basically pay a higher gas fee, which is going to incentivize the miner or the validator to do that transaction first. That's how it works. And they can essentially buy the cryptocurrency right before you do, okay, to actually cause the price to go up. So whenever they do that, it's going to affect the price. You're going to get less you know, cryptocurrency back than you thought you're going to, and they can instantly turn around and sell it right after you submitted your order. So you're going to get less. And also your cryptocurrency that you got is going to be worth less than what you thought it was going to be after the transaction. And that's all because they're able to look into the mempool, see the transactions that are coming in and then submit transactions that pay a higher fee. That's going to give it priority to get it into the blockchain, because anybody who's running the blockchain is going to be incentivized to basically include transactions that are going to make them more money. That's the whole incentive problem here is that people who operate the blockchain are basically going to include transactions first that are more profitable for them. 
So it's a system that can kind of be gamed in this regard. All right, so that's one example of minor extractable value. There's others when it comes to like arbitrage and there's, there's lots of other examples, but this is a really common one that affects most everyday users who might be trading tokens. And this of course is a massive problem that has to be overcome in order for this technology to reach mass adoption. And let me talk about a solution today that holds a ton of promise for this particular problem that's gaining a lot of steam. So one solution for this is created by Chainlink. Okay, one of the biggest players in the Web 3.0 space with their fair transaction sequencing protocol. Okay, so let's just do a quick recap of Chainlink of who they are and, you know, why they're such a big deal in this space. So Chainlink, of course, you might have heard of the Chainlink token. Okay, it's a pretty popular cryptocurrency, but Chainlink came onto the scene as an Oracle network. Okay, decentralized Oracle network. So what problem do they solve? Well, essentially, let's say, you know, that you want to get some information in your smart contract that's not native to the blockchain itself. Let's say that you want to get the price of, you know, Bitcoin on some exchange or something like that. Uh, or the weather, for example, right now, like the blockchain doesn't know about any of this information. Well, essentially, you need an Oracle for that, which is an outside data source. And really, anything could be an Oracle, but what you really want is a decentralized Oracle because, you know, if you were to ask me what the weather is, I might, you know, not give you an honest answer. I mean, I would, right? But let's just say some, you know, random person may not give you an honest answer on that, or you may not be able to reach agreement on what the weather is or the price is from any given moment, you know, with a, because of a race condition. So uh, basically, Chainlink uses a decentralized network to do that, and they've created a number of decentralized uh, networks and protocols to help solve those types of problems. So essentially, instead of asking one person for the information, you have a bunch of different people that come to consensus on what the information is and then provides that information to the blockchain, you know, like, like the weather, for example. So a similar approach can be used to solving the problem of minor extractable value uh, with their fair sequencing service, okay? So this is something that came out, or they've been working on for uh, quite some time now, okay? But they just did a demonstration of this with a prototype at the SmartCon uh, event that just happened a few weeks ago. And one of the reasons I want to talk about it now is because it's, you know, reaching a, a point where it's getting a lot of steam. And I think it's going to be an important uh, solution to watch for in the future. So how does it work? Well, essentially, it uses an Oracle network to enforce transaction order when things go into the mempool. So like I was saying before, when you go trade tokens on Uniswap or whatever it is, you know, all your transactions go to this mempool and that mempool can be completely gained because, you know, one uh, person can, you know, pay a higher fee to get their transaction included before yours and then reorder the transactions based on, you know, that financial incentive. And so what the Oracle network does uh, for fair transaction sequencing is it is it uses a decentralized protocol to essentially enforce that whatever transaction went in first that's exactly what's going to go in first and then nobody can insert anything uh, after that so uh, the reason for that is instead of having one person okay who can include something they have a financial incentive to go in first it uses a decentralized network of node operators to essentially say, all right, look, here's what the transaction order was, and they all agree on what the order was, and we're going to enforce that. And the incentive actually is for each person to act honestly so that they can get a reward for representing their version of the truth. And the outcome of this essentially is whenever you go trade a token on Uniswap, that nobody can basically insert their transaction before years and manipulate the price to where you know, you actually get back less cryptocurrency that you thought, and then they can dump the price of it later to where any cryptocurrency you actually got back is now worth less than what you thought it was going to be. So let's dig into the details about how it actually does this, okay? So fair transaction sequencing uses an ordering policy, including time of arrival, okay? So that's one approach, essentially, the time that the transaction arrived, that's the order that it's going to get enforced on, okay? Another thing that it can do, essentially, is encrypt the information of the transactions so you don't actually know what the transaction is going to do, okay, until after it's included into a block. So that removes the possibility to dig into what that transaction does, try to decipher it, and then put something before it. So it, it's really uh, anonymous in that sense, okay? So uh, it also supports different ways that users can submit the transaction to be ordered. You know, one way is essentially to put transactions directly into the mempool, like I was showing you before. Okay, so it still hits the mempool and essentially the, uh, you know, Oracle network is responsible for making sure that things, you know, in that mempool are actually included in the right order. And as long as the transaction hits the mempool, it doesn't matter how quickly the transaction is mined or validated in this case, depending on the blockchain, it, as long as it eventually does. And a real benefit here is that the user's transaction can get included at lower gas prices, which you might have seen problems in the past during like peak, peak network activity where, you know, lower gas transactions won't even get included. So another way that users can submit their transactions is to completely bypass the mempool directly, okay? So instead of having, you know, putting their transaction in this mempool, 
they can submit it to somewhere else that's going to eventually, you know, put their transaction into the blockchain with the fair transaction sequencing protocol. So essentially, the oracles will batch order the transaction together into a single transaction. And uh, the user per costs are greatly reduced and can even be implemented as a roll up. And so there's some different ways and how this can work and it has a ton of benefits because, you know, this fair transaction sequencing uh, can really be implemented on any layer one blockchain smart contract platform or layer two scaling solution like Arbitrum or Optimism, for example. Now, on a layer one like Ethereum, for example, you know, fair transaction sequencing is implemented on a per smart contract basis. So it's not like it should apply to the entire blockchain. If you build an app, then you actually have to implement this in order for it to take place. But if you use a layer two scaling solution, it could be implemented for all transactions. Like a layer two could just you know, include this as part of their default strategy. And of course, one big benefit, like I was talking about before, is that it can prevent front running on DEXs and it can reduce network costs by preventing the gas price bidding wars that you see where people are just paying a bunch of extra money to try to get their transactions included first. So you have less slippage, lower fees, and more fair applications. All right, so that's an overview of Chainlink's fair transaction sequencing protocol and why this is such a big deal for blockchain and the future success of this entire space. Again, Minor extractable value, maximal extractable value, whatever you want to call it, MEV, uh, is a real problem for this industry actually, you know, getting to where we want to go. And, you know, fair transaction sequencing is a really good strategy for fighting this problem, okay? And the reason I want to talk about this now is because, you know, this came up at SmartCon just a few weeks ago, and the demo of this was, you know, really good. And I think this is at a spot where it can start really gaining uh, some adoption to fight this problem in the future. So I hope you like this video. You know, as always, smash that like button down below for the YouTube algorithm. Subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. The really helps these videos out so the more people can learn about blockchain. And if you're as fast at this technology as I am, you want to get your hands dirty, how can you get started today? Well, you can go to my YouTube homepage. You can find my free courses there. They're like Udemy courses, but they're totally free. And if you like those and you want to take the next step or hey, maybe you want to take a master shortcut entirely, I can show you how to master blockchain step by step start to finish over at dappuniversity.com forward slash bootcamp. You don't have to be an expert to get started today. I've helped people with zero coding experience become real world blockchain developers in a matter of months. So that's all I've got. And until next time, thanks for watching Dapp University.